Uh, what is what we know? The sample. Very good. So this is the sample is what we know. And for most of us, the sample is the only thing that we know. Uh, some people are exceptional. For example, if you are hired at university registration office and your research question is, where is the distribution of where people are living? Uh, you know, how many are from North Van, how many are from Burnaby and so forth. Uh, you are in a special position who have access to population data. But for most of the human beings, what we have access to for most of our questions is what we know about the sample. And uh, basically the situation is that we have a population. We don't have access to the uh, population, but we can take a sample. And in that sample, we measure something, height, weight, uh, but we choose Let's say we are interested in the income of people. So we ask every person in the sample to tell us what is their income. And then we will end up having huge amount of numbers in our sample. What we have in our sample at the beginning is called data, a bunch of numbers. It doesn't really help us to make a decision. Okay? And the whole process of this chapter, chapter two, is to, it's called descriptive statistics. We want to describe what we have in our hand. We want to understand our data. And uh, uh, just remembering what we discussed last time, what is the minimum thing that we can do to our sample data? You know, data can have many different levels, but there is a minimum thing that we are interested in. Yes? We can categorize it? Exactly. So that is the minimum thing that we want to do. And let us start in this chapter with that minimum. So we have this bunch of numbers. You know, at least we can find out, uh, can we put them into categories? If we put them into categories, which category would have more data in it? What is the most frequent uh, you know, price of the housing in Whistler? So that's a good research question. And just by categorization, we will be able to answer those kind of questions. So this is the endeavor that we want to do. We have a bunch of numbers and we want to find out how many classes um, we can have, how many observations are in this class. And then we may find, like, where is the concentration of data? A useful recipe to determine the number of classes is two to the power of K rule. This guide suggests you select the smallest number K for the number of classes such that two to the power of K is greater than number of observations. So this is our formula, but it is not simply any K. We have to find the smallest K. So it's like a footnote there. You know, of course there are many, like if you choose two to the power of 1000, it would be very big number and it would be bigger than any sample size, but we don't want any K. We want the smallest K that satisfies that formula. That is the right number of classes, the best number of classes. And it comes from information theory. So then what we will do is that we will create classes. And then we will find the frequencies of those classes. For example, we say the first class is from this number to that number and this number to that number. And then we will count and after counting, we will realize that, oh, the concentration of data is in the, for example, third class. Please read the numbers. I'm going to write that on my screen. Yeah, so this is the, uh, you know, somebody has taken a sample, uh, the <clears throat> quick change oil company, and these are the number of oil changes. Sorry. And the question says, we want to do the minimum thing that we can do with this data, which is putting them in um, categories or classes and forming a frequency distribution. Uh, and the first question A says, how many classes would you recommend? We want to know how many classes are needed. What should I do? Was it uh, the 2K greater than N? Yeah, two to the power of K. We have to find the smallest K such that two to the power of K is greater than N. Very good. So to find, you know, of course, if you go to two to the power of 10, this will satisfy, but we don't want any K. We want the smallest K. So maybe we write it here, so, so not to forget the smallest 
So here I write it smallest k. So this is the way that we will start. You would say, okay, two to the power of one, is it greater than, how many numbers are there? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 20, I believe. 20, okay. So is two to, n, two, to, two to the power of one greater than 20? No. So we didn't find. So two to the power of two, is it greater than 20? No. No, we are not happy. Two to the power of three, is it greater than 20? No. No. What is two to the power of three? Eight. 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 Okay. Eight. So two to the power of four, is it greater than 20? No. No. Two to the power of five? Yes. What is yes. two to the power of five? 32. 32. Okay, very good. 32. So even if it was, if it was, you know, um, if the number of observations was 32, still 32 is not greater than 32. Then we have to go one more class. We want it to really be greater than, okay? But now two to the five is 32 and it is greater than 20. So we choose the number of classes to be? Five. Five. So this decision is made and it is written on a stone. You are not allowed to violate that, okay? So we made a decision. So what we have to do is that, you know, to make sense of this data, you know, a bunch of numbers, 65, we don't know what's going on. We have to uh, put them into categories at least. So we'll create a table. The first column would be classes or categories. And the second column would be the tallying that we do. So let's do that. Um, so now we want to create classes, five classes. Five classes is dictated to us by that formula. And we want to find out, um, you know, what those classes are. Uh, so what would be a good beginning of the first class? Five. Fifty. Fifty. Do we have a number 50 there? 51. Oh, we have 51. Okay. So we, this is what we will do. We will identify the smallest number which is 51, and we will identify the biggest number. What is the biggest number? 90, 98. 98, okay. So we want to create five classes that cover this range, and you are suggesting to start with 50. I agree with you, 50 is a beautiful boundary. You can also start from 51, but because you suggested 50, I will choose that one. So our first class will start from 50, and then you have no option other than here, writing two under. You cannot write 50 dash 60 or 50 260. If you do that, you will lose mark. Uh, let me tell you why. Because if you write something like this 50 dash 60, I don't know if 60 itself is in this class or not. Okay, so I would be, uh, you know, uh, in a suspense mode when I want to decide where does 60 go? Does it go to this class or not? So we will be more precise. And I want all of you to write two under and then we will decide about what would be the, the end boundary of this class. Um, there, in other edition of the book, uh, instead of two under, they say um, up to. That is also valid. So you can say 50 up to something. That means that the other boundary is not in this class, okay? The mathematical formulation is, uh, let's say, if you want to say 50 to 60, you'll say, this is the meaning of, the, this means inclusion. So we'll say 50 comma 60, and then you will uh, exclude the boundary, the ending boundary, meaning that 60 is not actually in this interval. But uh, you don't have to use the mathematical notation. Just similar to your book, you just say 50 to under. Now, question is, 
What should be the size of the class? 50 to what? If you choose, for example, a class of 20, let's see what happens. So if, you, if the class size or the interval to be 20, then your classes would be 50 to 70 to under. Two under 70, 70 to under 90, and 90 to under 110. And basically, it doesn't give us five classes. And if you use a class interval of five, then it would be 50 to under 55, 55 to under 60, 60 to under 65, 65 to under 70, 70 to under 75. And then with the five classes that we make with an interval of five, then we have a lot of numbers in our data set that don't have a class. Are you following me? So your interval cannot be too big because you will not have enough classes, cannot be too small because then there are some numbers who don't have any classes, okay? So uh, we need to find an interval. We cannot guess it. We have to find an interval that satisfies two conditions. We want We want the interval i uh, to create enough classes, which is five, and also that interval i must be such that for every number, we have a class. Yeah, so this is, this is what we want. And there is a formula, and the formula says that you, the, the interval that you choose should be greater than or equal to the maximum number minus the minimum number. And actually, this, is the, this has a you know, scientific name. This is called the range. And then we divide that by the number of classes. If you use this formula, it will give us enough number of uh, an interval that satisfies our need. So let's apply that. Um, if we apply that, I should be greater than, what was our maximum? 98. 98 minus, what was the minimum? 51. And what was the dictated number of classes? I. Five. Five. So our I should be greater than or equal to? 9.4. 9.4. Okay. Now, some hints about this. Although formula says I greater than or equal to 9.4, never use 9.4. Are you taking note? If you use 9.4, then the last number will not have a class most of the time. So never use 9.4. So I would suggest we can use I equal to 9.5 okay if we choose i equal to 9.5 then you know we are not going too much bigger than that so we don't have the risk that the last class will be empty and uh, it will give us the right number of classes however you'd say the classes that are their boundaries is like from 50 to 59.5 this is ugly i would like my class interval to be 10 and if you try that, that may be good. It may work or may not work. Um, the beauty is important in presentation of data as information. So we will try I. We go a little bit more than needed from 9.4 to 10. It is still satisfies I greater than 9.4. But when we do that, notice that we can have this danger that, you know, 50 to something and something, and then this last class, if you choose an interval that is too big, the last class may be empty. When that happens, don't panic. Go from that class interval that you have chosen, choose something smaller 
that is still satisfies this. So if you've chosen 10 and it didn't work, then choose 9.5 or 9.6 or 9.7. Choose something smaller such that your last class is not empty. You can never change K. Are you writing it down? If the formula says you need five classes, you cannot have four classes or six classes, but you can play with I and the beginning of the classes. Notice that if you remember, our smallest number is 51, but your friend nicely suggested that we can start from 50, and I agree with that. So you have liberty in some of these, especially on I, such that two conditions are satisfied. You must have five classes. This is what we want. After we finish this table, we want for every number to have a class. Okay, I write it here and then I will erase it because I want you to take note. We want for every number in the data set, we need a class. So if you create very big classes, um, the danger is that the last class will be empty, but if you create too few classes, then some of your numbers won't have classes, okay? So two conditions must be set. For every number, we need a class, and our first and last class cannot be empty. So you cannot create a frequency distribution table, cannot create classification. So, you know, you cannot start from 40. Then your first class would be 40 to 50 and it is empty. Doesn't make sense, okay? You cannot create your classes such that your last class is from 100 to 110. For what, okay? So you have to create five classes, but those classes must be meaningful. And meaningful uh, means that uh, should, you should have a class for every number that you have and your beginning and end classes cannot be empty. So we are going to use a, an interval of 10. Why? Because 10 is an interval that big, is bigger than 9.4 that the formula tells us, and it gives us nice boundaries, okay? Now, so the first class would be 50 to under 60. Second class would be 60 to under 70. 70 to under 80, 80 to under 90. So for four classes, 90 to under 100. And I still don't know if the two conditions are satisfied. Once we tally and we find out the, the frequencies, then we will make sure that the first and last class are not empty and we will make sure that for every number there is, an, there is a class. So now I will show you how we tally the observations into classes. So please, uh, so, so far, let me tell you the steps. Step one was identifying the number of classes. Step two was identifying the interval. Step three was forming the classes. And now we are at step four. You are um, reading the numbers and I will tally them. Read it slowly and with an order uh, for yourself and for me, so there is no mistake. Because if you do a mistake in this step, uh, you know, the rest of things that we do would be ruined. So read the numbers, please. Five. Uh, uh, I couldn't hear you. 65. 65, okay, 65 goes to this class. So I draw a vertical line here, okay. 98. 98 is here. 55. 55. Yeah. Okay, 55 is here. 62. 62. Very good. Um, do yes. you feel that I am in rush? No. No. We are not in rush. At this step, we have to relax and not rush very slowly because we are going to do a lot of things with these numbers. And this is the time that we are converting our observations to a frequency. 
no rush, very slowly. Next number is? 39. Uh, no, it's good that I keep the track of what you're reading. The next 79. number is? 79, very good. 79. 79, okay. And 59. 59 is here. 51. 51 is also here. 90. Oh, where is 90? God. Is 90 in the fourth class or fifth class? Last Just one, two, last. three, four, five. So where is 90? In the last class. Last class, yes. Okay. 72. 72. 56. 56. 70. Oh, 70. Very 70. Third grade. Where does it go? Third. Third class. Yes, I agree with you. Okay. 62. 66. 66. 80. Oh, tough question. Four Where does four? four. Very good. Okay. 94. 79. 69. 63. 60. Oh, 63 is the fifth number in this category. So we do this. So we put every five of them into a basket. Okay. 73. 73. 71. 71. And 85 is the last one. And 85. Okay, that was the end of tallying. And now we convert that to numbers. So this is 4, 5, 6, 2, 3. So now we have our frequencies. And to make sure that we didn't do any mistake, notice that some of these frequencies should be the total number of observations that we have. So four plus five, nine, 15, 20. Did we have 20 numbers? Yes. Very good. So by this, we have created a frequency distribution table. And uh, now it, it makes sense. Can you tell me, like looking at those numbers, we wouldn't be able to answer the question, but which class has most uh, frequency? 70 to 80. Yeah, so it seems that most of these numbers are around 70 and 90. And as we go toward the bigger number and as we go toward the smaller numbers, they go down, like the, the first class has four observations, the last class has three observations, but that central uh, class has six observations. So it seems that there is a central concentration there in the class of 70 to 80. So that gives us a, an understanding of how this, these numbers are spread. Um, so the most probable uh, outcome is 70 to 80, because it, we see a lot of uh, frequency there more than other classes. So most probable class or most frequently observed class is 70 to 80. But if I ask you what percentage of observations are in the third class, uh, what percentage of observations are in the third class? 30%. 30%. How did you calculate that? I did six divided by two because it was over it's, 20. Uh, six divided by 20, exactly. So that uh, is called relative frequency. I don't have a space to write it here, but I want you to take note in a descriptive way. We add a column that is called the relative frequency, and that shows the proportion of observations that are in every class. And later in future chapters, you'll see that this proportion is actually gives us a hint about the probability of things. The most probable outcome is in the class of 70 to 80, and the second most probable is in 60 to 70. Why? Because the proportion of observations that are in 
class 70 to 80 is uh, a bigger proportion. So these proportions, what we call relative frequency, we will write it in this column. So what is the relative frequency in the first class? 20%. 20 percent. Point two. Um, you don't don't answer in form of percentages except if I ask you. Uh, it's enough if we write point two. Don't go through that extra step of multiplying by one hundred, uh, which is the percentage. Um, except if I ask you what percentage, then you have to convert it to percentage. But the relative frequency is point two. Second class. Point two five. Point two five. Third class, point three. Point three. And uh, fourth class, point one. And last one, point one five. Point one five. Thank you very much. So now, with a glance on these numbers, we see that thirty percent of observations are in the third class, and twenty-five percent are in the second class. So. You know, it's much, much more informative than just looking at a bunch of numbers. We are now make, describing our data, and by that description, we are understanding what's going on. But, you know, a lot of times, including in elections, we may be interested in, um, um, like, if you combine the first two classes of people, will they have majority? Answer me. If you combine class one and class two, would they have majority? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> uh, why do you say yes? Look, how Actually, many no. people? Actually, how many no. people? No. No. No, they, they no. don't. Yeah, so you see, we want to be able to answer these kind of questions easily. So what we will do mm -hmm. is that we will add um, another column. Okay. We will add another column here, and that is called less than cumulative frequency. Again, I repeat that, and I want you on your notes, draw an arrow uh, or something and then explain so you know what is the meaning of LTCF, less than cumulative frequency, which is simply this. How many people are in the first class and classes less than that? How many people combined? How many people are in the second class and classes less than that combined? So answer me. How many people are in the first class and classes less than that combined? Four. Very good. How many people are in the second class combined with the classes less than that? Nine. How many are in the third class uh, combined with the classes less than that? Fifteen. Yeah, so for those who are not following, we're just adding these numbers. So 15 people are in the third class and all of the classes before that. How many people are in the fourth class and all of the classes before that? 17. 17. And how many people are in the last class and all of the classes before that? 20. 20. Obviously, because last class is, you know, the, uh, only the remainder of the numbers. So, of course, when we reach to the last class, the less than cumulative frequency is all of the observations. Okay. So now with this knowledge of less than cumulative frequency, answer me, if you combine the first three classes, will they have majority? Yes. Yes. Why do you say that? Because it's over 50%. Yeah, because there are 50, 15 people, yeah. and then in your brain, you did some calculation. and said, okay, 15 over 20 is 75%. Of course, they have majority. Okay? But I may ask you, what percentage were in the first class? Uh, what percentage were in the first class and second class combined? Why did you say that those two uh, are not majority? Uh, nine... You know, some of you did that, you know, lapse of judgment and you said the combination of the first two class of majority because, you know, we, we don't have right away in our mind what percentage are there. So to prevent that, we will add another column and that column is called relative less than cumulative frequency. Okay, I will wait for you to take a note about that 
you know, these abbreviations, I don't want to be mysterious for you. So this column is relative, less than, cumulative, frequency. And how much is the relative less than cumulative frequency of the first class? Two. Uh, no, in the first class, we have four people. In the first class, cumulative with all of the classes before that, we have four people. So how much is four relative to the total? Point two. Point two. Oh, I didn't hear the point that you said. Okay, point two. And now I give you a minute to calculate the relative less than cumulative frequency of all of the classes. Point so you, you look at the cumulative frequency of every class and you find what proportion of the total it is. So nine divided by 20, 15 divided by 20 and so forth. Okay, did you, did you finish? Yeah. Okay, so read the numbers for me. So what is the relative cumulative frequency for the second class and first class combined? 0.45. Thank you. 0.75. Uh, thanks. 0.85. Thank yeah. you. And one. And obviously it will be one because in, when we reach to the last class, the total number cumulative, uh, including the last class will be the total number of numbers. So you end up having one all the time, okay? So now it is easy. So if I combine the first two classes, what percentage of observations are there? 45. If I combine the first three classes, what is the percentage of numbers there in that combination? 75. If I combine, combine the first four classes, what percentage are there? 85%. So, uh, so the beauty of this is that once you compile this, you don't need to do any other calculations. Okay? But you know, people may say, why do you want to combine the first three classes? What if we combine the last two classes? Will they have majority? How many people are in the last two classes combined? How many people are in the last cl three classes combined? So to answer that kind of questions, because we don't have to necessarily combine the first three classes, we can combine the last classes. So that is called more than cumulative frequency. <laughs> and to create more than cumulative frequency, we um, um, find out how many observations are in the last class and all of the classes more than that combined. So first of all, tell me how many observations are in the last class? Three. Three. Very good. This is like, maybe I highlight this column. This is the most important column for us. This is the frequency. So how many observations are in the last class combined with classes after that? More than that? Three. Three. Because there is no classes more than that. So for the last class, the more than cumulative, cumulative frequency is three. Now, how many observations are in class four and all of the classes more than that? Five. Very good. And how many observations are in class three uh, and all of the classes more than that? 11. Very good. Um, more than cumulative frequency for second class? 16. More than cumulative frequency for the first class? 20. Obviously, because, you know, of course, from the first class, all of the classes, more than that combined, is the total number of classes, total number of observations, right? Are you following me? Okay. But um, now I ask you this question. If I combine the, fair, the last two classes, will they have majority? No. How many people are there combined? Eight. Uh, no, no. Five. Yeah, five. Uh, and it's not the majority. If I combine the last three classes, how many people are there? 
11. 11. And it seems that they have majority. But to be sure, majority means uh, more than 50%. So we can add a column that is called... Relative more than. Yes, relative more than cumulative frequency, which is the proportion of observations that are in uh, every accumulation combined. So uh, please do the calculations. I'll give you a minute. Sorry, can you repeat that? What was the R and P standard again? Uh, relative more than cumulative frequency. Thank you. So uh, here we know that in the last class and all of the classes more than that, we have three people. Therefore, we divide three by 20 and that gives us the proportion and uh, same. Sure. That 90 would be assigned to the 90 to 100 class. What about if in the data set we had 50? Could it not go into 50 to 60? Yeah, 50. Yeah, 50. Like these classes include the beginning, but they exclude the last one. So 52 okay. under means that 50 is included, but 60 is excluded because we go two under 60. Thank you. So class 50 to 60 includes 50, but doesn't include 60. I see. Thank you. Pleasure. I love these. These questions are very important. You know, it's better to clarify everything now, and then you will have a happy life when you are doing end of chapter questions. Okay. So what percentages of observations are in the last class combined with all of the classes after that? Uh, sorry, what proportion? 0 0.15. 0 0.15, very good. And the uh, fourth class combined with classes after that? 0.25. thank you. Um, third class combined with classes after that? 0.55. Thanks. And uh, second class cumulative with classes more than that? 0.8. Point eight, and obviously one because one hundred percent or all of the observations are in the first class and classes more than that. Good. So now with this, we have created a table that enables us to answer any question that we wish to answer, and. Um, um, I want you to have your table in front of you or you have my on my screen. I will ask you a bunch of questions uh, from all of the class members and then you can simply um, answer without doing any calculation. Just tell me uh, when I ask you a question, you ask me which column you are looking at and then you tell me the answer. Okay, so let's start with very easy things. How many observations are in the class from 60 to 70? Five. Very good. How many observations are in the first two classes combined? Four plus five, nine? No, no, I, listen, we did this table, to, you know, managers don't like addition, subtraction, and those kind of things. Right? Okay. So we prepared this, so they don't do any calculation. All of the calculations are done for us. So you just tell me, you, I go to that column and I answer you. No addition or subtraction or anything, no division. All of your answers are in front of you. So how many people are in the first two classes combined? Which column should we look at? LTCF. Yeah, so less than cumulative frequency is the uh, second class and classes combined to that. So we just, I just draw your eyes. You pay attention to this. Your eye goes to this column and the first two classes combined is written for us there. What proportion of observations are in the third class? Zero point three. Very good, very good. You don't, it's written there. So I want the proportion of the class. Your eyes go to this column and this is the answer. You don't need to do 
any calculation. What proportion of observations are in the fifth class? <coughs> um, 0.15. Very good. How many observations are in the first three classes combined? Um, uh, 0 0.75. No, I didn't ask what proportion. I said, how oh. many people are in the first three classes combined? 15. Very good, 15. Combination, less than community frequency because it says the first classes combined. So it is 15. What proportion of people are in the first four classes combined? Okay, how about I make it a small, uh, easier first. How many people are in the first four classes combined? 17. Very good. Now, the original question was, what proportion of people are in the first four classes combined? It is written just in front of 17. Everything is there. What, do you, what is the number you see in front of 17? 0.85. Very good. That's the proportion of people that are in the first four classes combined. How many people are in the last two classes combined? We go to more than cumulative frequency and the combination of the last two classes is right here. Two plus three is written here. Uh, how many observations are in the last three classes combined? Last Joshua? Classes, there are 11 observations in the MTCF. Very good, very good. What percentage of, what proportion of observations are in the last three classes combined? 0 0.55. Very good, very good. What proportion of observations are in the first three classes combined? Six. Now, what proportion of observations are in the first three classes combined. Okay, so let us start from there. How many observations are in the first three classes combined? 15. How did you find that? LTCF. Lovely, okay. So 15 observations are in the first three classes combined, but I ask you what proportion is that? So what proportion of observations are in the first three classes combined? 0 0.75. Exactly. It is written right in front of it. Life is sweet. When you have a frequency distribution table, you have a lovely life. You just put your hand on, the, you know, on your table and you look at it and you answer me. That's the beauty of it. Okay. So let me uh, uh, remind you what, what were the steps. Steps are, one, you identify the, the number of classes. Two, you identify the interval. Three, we form the classes. And four, step four is this one. Uh, we form the frequency. And once we have the frequency, then the rest is mechanical. Relative, relative less than, more than, and so forth. Okay, so... Can you repeat step three and step four, please? I okay, step one, and maybe I highlight it uh, with which color I didn't use, green, okay? So this is a step one, you identify the number of classes and it is written on a stone. What, if the number of classes must be five, it must be five. Step two was identify the interval. For interval, you have some flexibility. It must be greater than, greater or equal to that, uh, you never use that exact equal, you go a little bit more, but for beauty purposes, you may decide to go a little more than that. After you decide the, the interval, then step three is you form your classes based on that interval. And a step four is that you count the number of observations in those classes. And once you have the number of observations in each class, the frequency column, then 
you go forward. Uh, the proportion, cumulative frequency, less than, more than cumulative frequency, and so forth. But now look at this. Uh, once we form this uh, frequency distribution table, we can actually, to, to answer questions about the shape, uh, we go to the domain of visualization. And uh, the visualization of a frequency distribution is called a histogram. In a histogram, we will first on x-axis we will show the, uh, the boundaries of the classes. So what was the boundary of our first class? Fifty. Fifty. Now, there are two options. I show you both options for visualization. Okay? One is that we say, okay, this is 10, this is 20, this is 30, 40, and then the first class is 50 to 60. What was the frequency of the first class? Four. Four. So you go up four. This is one way of doing it. So, but the problem is that if the first class was starting from 150, then we would have a chart that 10, 20, 30, well, it's all empty and the first column starts at 150. So to prevent having this empty space, the other way that you can correctly present your chart is that you can say, uh, mention to the reader that I am skipping part of my chart. So you break your x-axis, you draw two lines like this, and then you say the first data starts from 50 to 60. So both ways is good. But if your beginning of your data is far from zero, then it's better to, to do this. So you cut your x-axis, and then you will identify the boundaries of your classes. Then you don't have to go to, you know, you don't have to show a lot of empty space in your chart. 90, and then the, bound, the last, the ending boundary of the last class is 100. Okay, so the first class was uh, four. How many people are in the second class? I don't have the Five, numbers. Six. Yeah, in the, from 60 to 70. Five. Five, so a little higher. So this is four. This is five. Uh, in the class from 70 to 80? Six. Six, okay, so it goes even higher. Uh, notice that your, your scale must be, must be more beautiful than mine. And then 80 to 90? Two. Two, so it would be half of four. And 90 to 100? Three. Three, so it should be a little bit higher than this. Okay, so now this is uh, the, the visualization of the shape of the distribution. Again, we see that there is a concentration at the center and the highest frequency observation is in the third class. And this is five, this was six, this was two. And uh, this is three, right? And this, uh, so X axis is the categories and Y axis was what we are showing on the Y axis? Frequency, right? So this is the frequency. Okay. Now, but just think about this. If I wanted to present the relative frequency or the proportion that is in every class, um, would the shape be different? If I wanted to present the relative frequency. So to, if I wanted to present the relative frequency, this height four should be divided by 20. This height five should be divided by 20. Every height should be divided by 20. But the, the relative shape would be exactly the same. Right? So I can draw the same shape 
And then on, on, the, uh, on the vertical axis, I have to scale it differently. It's like 20 times the smaller, right? Every number is divided by 20 for relative frequency. Are you following what I'm saying? So the shape would be the same. So most of people don't draw another diagram for relative frequency. This is what they do. They add, and I want you to do that. So you draw another axis on the right side and you call it relative frequency. And then for every of these, you divide it by 20 and you write it here. So this, which from the frequency point of view, it is four. From relative frequency point of view is how much? First class. Zero. Point four divided by point two, and this would be point twenty five, and this would be point three. This is point one, and this is point one five. Okay, so basically, this chart is showing us at this at one time right away two visual presentations of data, both relative frequency and frequency. Um, so let, let me ask you a question, using this chart. How many observations are in the class interval 80 to 90? Use this chart, don't look at the table. How many observations Two. are in the class of 80 to 90? Two. Two. Very good. What percentage of observations are in the class of 80 to 90? 10%. 10. 10. 10. 10. So just look at this. Your eye moves to the left side when I ask a question about frequency and your eye moves to the right side when I ask you a question about relative frequency. So uh, and now because you asked the question about uh, the visualization, I just added this. But in our next class, we will talk about uh, various types of uh, visualization. And then we will talk about, um, you know, handy way of creating frequency distributions. And uh, I think we will be done for this chapter. I suggest you working on the end of, on, uh, end of chapter questions that are similar to what we did today. Just speak about the answers to all of end of chapter questions are on Moodle. Just uh, choose a question, a number of questions, and make sure that you are able to create a complete frequency distribution table. Even if the question doesn't ask you a complete one, always do a complete one and practice. I know that you want me to continue and learn more about this witchery, but we will go slowly, class by class. So see you next class. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks a lot.